Happy holidays! The Christmas season looked very different this year, but perhaps one of the most positive things that arise from the pandemic has been the visible impact on our planet's health. And according to the Nature's Journal, the first half of 2020 saw an 8.8% decrease in global CO2 emission, and this is largely due to the reduction in energy usage, industry output and transportation. These sectors are commonly associated with carbon emissions, but what about the carbon footprint of the food that we consume every day? What about the carbon footprint of this plate of rice that is right in front of me? My name is David Chen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Golden Sunland, Singapore's little rice company. The company is born in Singapore, but we're based in Myanmar and we are driven by sustainability. We're a local company that partners smallholder farmers in climate smart rice production, also a certified B Corp and a member of the Sustainable Rice Platform. Golden Sunland's mission is to empower our growers and guiding them in responsible agricultural practice so that the world can continue to have rice for generations to come. But why does sustainable rice even matter? And why does carbon footprint of rice matter? I'm getting a little bit hungry, so before we move on to the heavy stuff, let's check in with Ian who's whipping up something exciting with our rice. Hello there, today we'll be cooking a festive dish that's perfect for the holiday dinner table. Pumpkin risotto. Risotto typically uses arborio rice, and today instead we're going to use our whole grain brown rice from the Little Rice Company. With its distinct like fragrance and plus texture, our whole grain brown rice is similarly able to retain its structure after cooking. And I'll quickly introduce you the ingredients required to cook our pumpkin risotto. Okay, and let's begin cooking. Okay, first bring up your wok to a temperature and let it heat up. You need to add olive oil to the dish. Okay, once the oil is hot, the first thing that we add it will be the onions and celery. Okay, because, because the aromatics are very finely grated, it's important that uh, you do not uh, sauté them for too long. Now you add in the grated garlic. A quick 30 second sauté will be all you need. Okay, the next ingredient will be your palm oil uh, brown rice. Okay. Stir well and ensure that every single grain of rice is well coated in ar aromatics. Add in about half, half a cup of uh, white wine. White wine adds uh, acidity and complexity to the dish and will make it uh, bring an extra oomph to the dish. Make sure you cook off all the alcohol. Okay, once the alco alcohol is cooked off, you can add in your vegetable stock. And you can start adding in your starch water. This is starch water that we, that we used previously to boil the rice. Okay, at this stage, it's very important to keep stirring the rice because uh, the agitation of the rice grains will uh, release the starch from the rice and this will thicken the sauce later. Okay, you add in your herbs, your rosemary, and your thyme. Okay, the reason why I use uh, vegetable stock instead of uh, vegetable stock cube, instead of vegetable stock, is because I'm better able to control the amount of salt that goes into the dish. And you season with pepper. Okay, as the rice, as the rice is about to uh, be cooked, you, you should taste it consistently. You should still have a tiny little bite to it as you taste it. And that's the time when you start adding your 
pam- cooked pumpkins. Okay, in, uh, for risotto, it's, it's important to cook the vegetables and the rice separately because uh, because of different cooking times. If you cook the vegetables in, uh, in the rice, you typically cook the disintegrate before you finish cooking. Here you'll be still be able to taste uh, chunks of uh, pumpkin. Okay, once the rice is cooked, you start adding, uh, you start taking the sauce. So you put your a knob of butter. and a healthy serving of cheese. Okay, mix well. Okay, because of the starch in the dish, the butter will start uh, emulsifying with the starch and it will not form a layer of oil on top of the dish. Okay, you will know your risotto is thick enough when you drag across the, the, the bottom of the pan and you see a trail. Right now it's still too watery. We'll give it a few more minutes. While waiting for the rice to simmer, let's find out from David what makes our rice so special. Despite being a staple for half of the global population, it is largely overlooked that rice is actually both a victim and contributor of climate change. Globally, rice production accounts for 30 to 40% of freshwater supply and it takes up to 160 million hectares of land to feed us. Perhaps one of the most significant but again overlooked facts is the fact that it also contributes to 19% of the global methane emission. So impact-wise, this is almost as much as 1,200 coal plants around the world. Scary numbers aside, it is important to understand that cultural, and the nutritional importance of rice to over 3 billion people around the globe. Over thousands of years, rice has been weaved into our culinary tra- traditions and provides 20% of daily calories, especially for those in developing countries. So exactly what is the Little Rice Company trying to do here? We have embarked on a very ambitious balancing act to see how we can better manage the environmental impact of rice production knowing that this is essential for half of the global population. And staying true to what Singaporeans are good at, efficiency is key. Through our seed R&D and provision of agronomic advice to our farmer partners, the yield of our best performing farmers have tripled since uh, our intervention. And what this really means is that we are utilizing water and land with three times more efficiency. By doing so, we effectively lower the carbon footprint of our rice. So since 2018, we started on a journey to to quantify the carbon footprint of our rice production. We have successfully reduced our carbon footprint from 5.8 kg of CO2 equivalent for every kilo of rice to just 1.16 kg of CO2 equivalent to 1 kg of rice. Now, while there isn't an industry standard available right now, for the consumers to compare the carbon footprint of rice across the board. But what Golden Sunland and Little Rice Company is committed to do is to make such information transparent and we will continue to work on incrementally reduce this carbon footprint. For us, it is important not just to empower our producers but also to equip our end consumers with the right knowledge and visibility of a responsible supply chain. Okay, now it's, it's about to be ready. Okay, and you're ready for painting. Oh. So I'll say good things are worth the wait and this is really good. And I'm glad to know that um, our team members are really versatile. Other than growing rice, we can also cook the rice well. Thank you for joining us today. I think our team here would like to wish everyone a happy holidays, eat healthy, and have a merry new year. Bye. Hi everyone, so my name is David. 
Um, you have just seen our, our recorded video. Uh, Merry Christmas in advance to everyone. And uh, even throughout the video, I've seen a couple of questions coming out. Uh, unfortunately, I'm good at eating. I'm not a chef, but I've taken down all the questions about uh, all, all, the, all your questions about the recipes and I'll make sure I pass it over. So the other thing I'm actually good at is planting, um, which is why uh, when we introduce a company, um, we always introduce ourselves as rice growers rather than rice importers. Um, so per personally, I spend, well, I, I used to spend about 60% of my time in Myanmar, but because of COVID, so we haven't been traveling. And um, Golden Sunland really take pride um, to be one of the rare Singapore companies that is working with the Myanmar local farmers. So uh, largely in Myanmar, um, we have two, two main sites. Um, our HQ, where we are building a rice processing plant, is in Nepidor. Nepidor is where the current capital of Myanmar is. And we have a site project uh, at the Eawadi Delta region with some of the international NGOs. Um, and I guess uh, the, the best way to run this session is a bit of an interactive Q&A. I do have a slide that I could put up but uh, I thought it'd be more fun if we can have a little chat. Um, yeah, okay, so far, okay, so I think I've answered the question about where the rice fields are located. Uh, Recipe-wise, actually, uh, on our website, uh, www.thelittlericecompany.com, we do have quite a fair bit of recipes over there. And then on our social media as well, we put up a recipe every now and then. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave my email I'm going to leave my email for everyone. So whatever that I can't answer you during this session, feel free to drop me an email and then I'll consolidate and get back to you guys. But like I said uh, about the food, I have already asked Ian about it. All right. So um, I guess what I should probably do is maybe I will just share the slides instead. And you know, at any any point in time when when there's question, I will just uh, pause and I'll, I'll take the question. So I assume everyone can see the slide, right? Yes, yes, someone, someone, someone give me a sign, otherwise I feel a bit lost. Okay, Ken. So, um, so Growing Rice, Growing Life is actually Golden Sunland's uh, mission statement. Um, and the Little Rice Company is a, a brand under, under our company. And the Growing Rice part is, is simple, right? It's, it's basically business, you know, the act of growing rice. But we always felt that um, the lives of the stakeholders are rather important, and it's not just the farmers' livelihood, but also the consumers as well. Um, I think one thing that a lot of us don't realize is the fact that the, the smallholder farmers are, you know, effectively our food system because there's just simply so many of them. So while it is important for us to make uh, progress in urban farming, indoor farming, but soy-based traditional farming is still contributing to more than half of a global, global uh, food production at this moment. So we coined this the smallholder wicked problem. And largely, I think a bit cliche, climate change is definitely one of the big problems that these smallholder farmers are facing. And because these smallholder farmers, for example, like those in the Delta region, they are like 10 to, 10 to 15 hours away from the city. So the lack of infrastructure prompt um, the development of multiple meter men uh, throughout the entire value chain. And because there are so many people within the value chain sharing the value, uh, ultimately there's widespread poverty and the farmers are usually the one that is suffering the most. So this is not really a, a, a soft story. I mean, uh, that's not what we're trying to portray, but our, our key mandate and our key objective is to try to get the consumers to understand that we are all part of the problem. So I think everyone here, if you're here, uh, I'm lightly preaching to the choir. I think everyone believes in long-term sustainable production. Uh, but we also have to bear in mind that what the farmers really want at this moment, right? We are talking about farmers who earn less than $2 a day. So their short-term requirement is seriously how to put food on the table today, tomorrow, and perhaps the next week. So ultimately, there's a little bit of mismatch. Right, I mean, as a developed nation, um, as uh, consumers with higher spending power, we can demand for organic stuff and such, but 
sometimes, uh, you know, we need to go through this transformation and progression phase for us to really reach that stage. So the sustainability that we are promoting is something that I, I feel it should be a little bit more holistic other than just a single dimensional focus on environmental, we should also look at the farmer's livelihood as well. So these two pictures, left and right, on the left uh, is our field in Myanmar, it's just taken two years ago. On the right is a field in the United States. And, you, and we realized that after the Green Revolution, um, the, the agriculture scene between the east, east side of the world and the west side of the world looked very, very different. And um, we had, centuries of industrialization for the Western sphere to develop these large machineries at state level farming when everything is more consistent, everything is more synchronized. But looking forward, th there is the pressure of climate change. So perhaps right now we need to think of something else. We need to think of something different to make this uh, farming more sustainable. And we're also looking at a mega trend where especially in Myanmar in particular, is a developing nation. So they're going through industrialization and a lot of people are going to move away from agriculture into the urban space. They will become middle income and they will start to work in factories. They will start to want to get more consistent and stable jobs. And actually that means that there'll be less and less farmers in the field who can produce for us. So I want to speak, I want to, I want to jump to this picture. I want to jump to this very quickly. And I think this will be, I'll, I'll make this my last slide and then I would like to have a discussion and some questions. So this is paddy field then and now. So on the left, that is Japan. And that is, if I remember correctly, in the 19, 1900s. And on the right is Myanmar and this picture was just taken two years ago. So one of the things that we've been trying to highlight to whether it's consumer, whether it's investors, or whether it's just public in general, I think what we don't realize is while we have made a lot of, lot of progress, uh, there are a lot of breakthrough in terms of technology, but some of this technology doesn't always apply to the smallholder farmers who are still very traditional, who are disconnected from the rest of the world. So, which is why I think the key objective of Golden Sunland establishing a little rice company brand uh, other than selling rice, it is really for education purpose. We're trying to get the consumers to understand and we're trying to bridge the, the gap between the consumers and the producers. Um, okay, I've got one question. Are the products only found online? Uh, okay, so at this moment, uh, our product is only, uh, you can only find our product on Lazada and Shopee, but uh, we have successfully onboarded with one of the key supermarkets in Singapore. So do, do expect to see our rice uh, on the supermarket shelf uh, within this year. And uh, I want to go back to the previous thing that we were talking about. So one of the key objective is for us to bridge the consumers and the producers. And why is this important? Uh, I would like to share a story with you guys. When, when we first visited the farmers in, in the Delta region, um, if you had the chance to Google uh, our company, um, CNA last year on the red dot, they did a feature. So basically that's where we went. And the first time we interviewed the farmers, after the, the first time we interviewed the farmers and uh, we, the, the farmers showed us the rice field and we asked them, so uh, do you purchase your rice or do you grow your own rice for your own consumption? Then the farmers just tell us that, okay, this is the rice field. This part is where we produce rice for our own consumption and this is the part where I do not put any chemical and any other funny stuff in there. And this part is the one that I sell to the market and in order to maximize profit, I, I will put chemical to kill all the pests I can find. So, so that's something that is, you know, obviously now as a consumer, after this message, you, you probably have doubt about the rice that you are eating. But if you turn around and, and look at us as consumers, um, while if you take the statistic, right, 144 million smallholder farmers are producing rice for 3.5 billion people around the world. That's one farmer to every 24 consumers. But these farmers are earning so little. So in the sense that we have not made any significant uh, changes and improvement to our livelihood. So, you know, fair is fair, right? Why should they care about well, uh, our well-being? And it's also not um, fair for us to say that, oh, consumers are evil and consumers are the ones causing all this problem. 
is largely because most of the consumers are not aware of this problem. Rice is so cheap, right? And uh, we see people waste rice on a daily basis. You go to a hawker center, the amount of rice that's wasted on, on a daily basis is because we, we simply cannot relate what the farmers are going through and we cannot comprehend the consequences of us throwing this plate or half a plate of rice away, right? Essentially, 150 days of work down the drain, right? And just now, okay, so one of the questions uh, they asked, how much, how much middleman cost is being reduced for one bag of rice? So today, if you go to a retail, if you go to a retail market, um, I think on average, uh, whatever you pay at the retail level, the farmers get maybe about 10 to 15% max of the retail. And middleman costs uh, fluctuate. And this is how the middleman work. This is the farmer. And when the farmer um, harvests the product, the, the grains need to be processed and they need to be able to bring the grains to the rice mill. But as I mentioned just now, especially in the Delta region, where the farmers are and where the rice mill is, they're very, very far away. So you have this middleman who's traveling and uh, bridging, bridging the farmers with the rice mill. They are honestly a necessary evil, but they can also be a little bit more optimistic, uh, optimist, uh, opportunist, opportunistic, sorry, can't pronounce that word, right? And so for example, uh, in Myanmar, uh, while the government, um, the, the, the government typically announced the, the floor price of the rice, um, one usually one kilogram, uh, one kilogram of paddy. That means uh, rice with a half on uh, can't be eaten, need to be processed. Uh, will cost anything between uh, thirty cents to thirty five cents thing. Uh, that is the government floor price. But typically, the middleman will try to squeeze it down by about a good twenty to thirty percent. So it's a bit hard to calculate the middleman's cost in the perception of one bag of rice. But uh, middlemen, because they are kind, they kind of have a little bit more power because the farmers cannot reach a rice mill, right? So typically when the farmers are desperate to sell, they would usually agree to whatever price the middlemen offer. So um, they are necessary evil. Uh, there's a very good publication called uh, Paddy to Plate uh, done by a Myanmar NGO which give a very good description of what this uh, middleman does and how much they earn. Uh, they are not necessarily all bad all the time. Uh, you still have some who are pretty good. And uh, like I said, their key role is really to, to match uh, the farmers with the rice mill and kind of to help to bring the farmers to the market. So what, what we do differently is instead of, um, so at the end of the season, um, the farmers got to go through this nerve wracking period where they need to make sure that someone come and uh, purchase our product. So what Golden Sunland does differently is we, we give the farmers a guaranteed uh, buyback program right at the very beginning. So at the beginning of the season, six months before the harvest, uh, we agree on a guaranteed price and we have 100% off take. So what this does, uh, in a way, um, it shortens the process. It ensures that the produce does move to the market because post harvest loss is, is about 20%. So sometimes, when a farmer and a middleman could not agree on the price, there's a standstill, the farmers hold on to the rice and the, the, the rice doesn't get, the paddy doesn't get to the market. Uh, but what we are really doing by offering a guaranteed price and a guaranteed offtake is to give the farmers a sense of security and peace of mind so that they can move on uh, to do other things in life, so that they can move on to the next season, uh, so that they can start preparation for the next season and don't have to worry about post harvest loss. Losses. So those are just some of the things we do. So Golden Sunland, truly we bring um, full traceability of the field. And I think when I say traceability, uh, today uh, the consumers are still fairly conservative. When you walk into, today when you walk in a supermarket, when you go and look for rice, it's either organic or non-organic. There isn't in between. And just now I, I talk about the concept of holistic sustainability, right? So we will assume that a pair of organic rice is the most sustainable. And I will say that that's true. That, that is true if um, there is sufficient volume to sustain a farmer's livelihood. 
uh, most of the time, or rather sometimes, or at least the farmers that we encounter, uh, it doesn't happen that way. So while we, we believe in organic farming, but Golden Sunland's first objective is to get the farmer's livelihood to a level where they can sustain themselves. It, we, we are a member of a sustainable rice platform, and sustainable rice, sustainable rice platform use a very practical and logical um, certification program where it is different from organic. Uh, there would still be use of um, uh, chemical, chemical fertilizers and such, but the use of these chemical fertilizers are all strictly adhering to the EU uh, conventions and make sure that they are not harmful to the environment. So while Golden Sunland will work towards uh, organic farming, but uh, this is um, this is a long project. This is not something that will happen within the next two or three years. To get the consumers to understand the impact of rice farming uh, and to get the consumers to appreciate more, therefore allow us to uh, really build out the system and transform the rice industry and nudge sustainability as a norm. Right. So. I know I've been rambling a lot, there's not much question, uh, but if there's one key message you're going to take away from the last 10 to 15 minutes, I guess, is don't waste rice. Uh, it's really bad breaking, and a lot of these farmers, um, they have no other alternatives for, for income. So while a lot of us, uh, we might never experience how rice is ever being grown, but uh, just try to leave try to survive a day with just ten dollars. I mean ten dollars in the pocket and, and, and see and see how that works out. Right. So please don't waste rice and uh try our rice. Our rice is nice. And if you are interested uh to look out for the recipe you can go on social media or you can drop me an email and yes, never never waste food. All right. And uh never waste rice really never waste rice. Eat less, you know, go to, when, you, when you go out for a food restaurant, go to hawker, uncle, auntie to give you less. Yes, order less, ask them to give you less. I think that's really crucial. And, and we'll, thank you, we'll, we'll thank you for it. That's, that's really the, the bare minimum consumers can do to help this ecosystem be more sustainable. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, um, I've asked the chef, but the chef has not replied me. Uh, so I left my email. Uh, Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll try to engage anyone again. All right, thank you.